All right, we're live. I am uh, live. <laughs> so excited to have. Uh, so your business is a business that I have been a fan of from afar, even though we've never uh, met before. Because I was walking down the street on Ninth Avenue in New York City, and I and I, I I learned two things about you, your company, right away by virtue of an ad. I learned that phone booths still exist because somehow you took out an ad on a phone booth. <laughs> and two, I learned that Michael Phelps has this story I never knew about him. And I, I, I sort of stopped in my track and thought, you know, it's interesting when you have the convergence of marketing, right? And a really important product that people need to know about and a passionate endorser and they all come together. And I, and I thought, again, we never met each other. I even posted on Instagram probably a year and two years ago thinking this is uh, tremendous that you brought it together. So um, just want to get into it. I have the founders of Talkspace, Ronnie and Oran, who are husband and wife, originally from Israeli, uh, Israel, been here 12 years. And we're going to cover all sorts of topics about mental health, about how people cohabitate and seem to be making it work because you don't seem pissed at each other. I'm going to get into that. Just make sure. Do a little couples therapy right here. But your your mission and mandate is to bring uh, therapy to the masses. And I would say, judging by people I talk to and how many take advantage of your service, you have succeeded since 2012. And I know you've told the story so many times, but I think everybody out there is kind of fascinated to hear you know, what made you launch your journey and sort of to couple up as married and business partners? So um, our journey to the therapy world, mental health world started with our, with our own personal experience. Uh, our marriage was falling apart. And it was, it was about fault, right? I just want to blame. I just want to get that out there. <laughs> <laughs> He left me mad. <laughs> okay, all right, fair, fair. <laughs> it, okay? Yeah. Um, our marriage is falling apart. It was about three years into our marriage. And then we decided to give it last chance to couple therapy. Of course, we're, doing, we're talking about traditional face-to-face -face therapy. There was no online therapy, remote care at the time. Although it feels a little like a couple therapy session with you on the, on the, on the right hand. <laughs> <Right. laughs> And it, so, and it did two things. One, it literally saved our marriage, and we can talk a little bit later about what we did in couple therapy and how it changed our relationship. And we've also been, both of us have been in individual therapy, and therapy had so much impact on my life, and I felt so empowered by therapy that I decided that I want to leave my career. I was a software developer at the time. I worked at Amdocs. So, you know, I'm coming from the high-tech high world. I graduated, graduated with a computer science degree. But I felt that, you know, all of this world I'm not passionate about. And I really wanted to do something that I, that I really care about and passionate about and give me some sense of meaning and purpose. And I decided to just to leave the high-tech world. And I went back to graduate school to study psychology because I believed I wanted to be a therapist. And... Two years into my master's, I did master's in New York, I learned that the mental, mental health system in America is completely broken. Just to give you quick numbers, one in four people are diagnosed with mental health issue, issues each year. However, 70% of them, 70% of those who are diagnosed have no access to care. And this is a disgrace and or and i started to explore together at home we're both passionate about this uh, problem we wanted to fix it and we started to explore how technology how a digital health platform um, can open access to mental health care for every person in need and this is how the vision of the company was born I'm curious. So back to the Genesis moment and you too. And I thank you for being so open about it because it's a, a great topic for people to talk about. You know, marriage is so important and you got to fight to save it and do everything you can. What, were either of you, did you feel the stigma around couples therapy before you started or were you both all in? I, I, I definitely felt the stigma uh, less about the couples therapy because I, ha I had a strong motive. I wanted it to work. And I think to overcome stigma, unfortunately, in most cases, you need to be in pain. Um, talking about stigma, which is very helpful and very modern and very common nowadays, not doesn't really deliver the goods. You need to you, you need to actually engage in real treatment with someone because the people that overcame stigma are the people that got help from a therapist or a psychiatrist or or a social worker or whatever. 
Uh, but I did feel the stigma when I went to my own personal one-on-one -on -one therapy, you know, definitely. That's a uh, brilliant point what you said about a second ago, just to stick with that. Like stigma is an abstraction. I remember I, you know, all my life, I never went to therapy. I was one of those people that said, I don't need any help. I've been through all sorts of trauma as a kid and I muscled and powered my way. And then around the same time you started this company, something happened in my personal life that brought me to my knees and I was shocked. And I remember sitting in the car, sort of tears streaming down my face saying like, oh, I, I, can't, I, I can't hack it. And I remember looking up a therapist and finding somebody local and transformed everything. And I used to call her my mom. You know, she was my surrogate paid mom for an hour. But, but I remember walking out and thinking, you're such an ignoramus. Like all these years you thought you were better than that, right? And so to your point, it wasn't overcoming the stigma. It was desperation and need that got me there. But I, but I guess part of the journey and mandate of your company is to have people skip that spot, to lower the bar of desperation. Yeah, right? Exactly right, because that's unfortunate. You don't want to get, like in, in any other healthcare condition, you, want to, you don't want to get to that stage. You want to treat this almost like preventative medicine and be aware of your potential deterioration of pain way ahead before it gets to the point in which you sit in a car and cry. I mean, it's not bad in its own right. And, and, I, and I think looking at you, it probably delivered the goods. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but people deteriorate far further than that. And people get to, you know, taking their own lives and making huge mistakes. And it's completely unneeded. And stigma definitely plays a part in that, in, in avoiding, you, you know, or um, denying the help that you can and should get help. Yeah. So wait, you go from, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. No, I just wanted to say 15 years ago when we did to a couple therapy, I did feel the stigma. Uh, you know, oh, how come we cannot just be happy without any help? You know, my parents had this amazing relationship. They never needed help. Like, what's wrong with us? <laughs> and um, so I feel like now it's just getting so much better. And now everybody, all of our friends are talking about their uh, relationship issues. So stigma has decreased dramatically for sure in the last 10 years. Well, so how do you go from, so you two are so cute. I would have killed you if you got divorced, by the way. I just want to put that out there. All right. So next time we have any issues. Without seeing our daughters, which are the real value. <laughs> okay. Fair. The whole package. But I had uh, so, 22 years together now. <laughs> Oh, you're so cute. Wait, so how'd you go from, how, but how do you go from, okay, marriage is in trouble. You go through therapy, presumably whoever that person was, please make sure you post their name and number because quite effective. But then you pivot to then saying, we're going to launch a business, which is a complete different level of commitment. Like how oh, does that play out? So there is a big gap between those two. In, in, and during this gap, you know, I go to face to one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy Ronnie goes to one-on-one -on -one therapy and studies psychology in, in first in Israel and then in New York. And then I actually uh, decide that I cannot continue with my previous career, which was in marketing and advertising. That was around 2011. And we start thinking about the future because I couldn't do it anymore. You know, I came back home and I told, you know, no offense to any of my friends, the ad guys. Uh, if I do it a little more, I'm going to get cancer, probably in my stomach. Uh, and we say, all right, so what's next? And then we start discussing, you know, as Ronnie mentioned before, we start researching. That's a very nice term to Googling, which is does online therapy work? Have people tried that? You know, what's the data that exists? Why did it fail? And we started to form, you know, together a thesis of how to open access, which was always, you know, Talkspace's mission, which is open up access to psychotherapy in particular and behavioral health in, in general. And before you know it, you're with a startup and you have a theme and you have a, uh, a slide deck <laughs> and, 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 and you start a company. It was, you know, it, for, at least for me, it was almost an unconscious uh, flow that, was, that felt very natural. So just to add to what Oren's saying, you know, we wanted to fix the system. We were both passionate about doing something that literally has meaning for us. And what we did, that the first thing for us to do is to research why the traditional, service, traditional services are not working. What are the barriers to the traditional therapy? Because if you want to fix a system, you need to understand why it's broken. And then we learned that there are three main barriers. Number one is, of course, cost. Traditional therapy is very expensive. The average cost of a face-to-face 50-minute session is somewhere between 
100 to 300 dollars and that's of course a price point that most people cannot afford the second barrier is access and convenience you know how you find a good therapist and then you need to commute and you need babysitter for your kids and you need to um, spend two hours a week you know with commuting and sitting six it's like just very time consuming and it's not accessible and not convenient and last but not least stigma and uh, you know many people just feel uh, prefer to suffer in silence instead of reaching out for help and this is very sad so or and I started to think about how technology how a digital health platform can remove those barriers such as cost access and stigma and expand access to quality mental health care and we launched the first product in 2012 the group therapy <laughs> it was a miserable failure I say, what was, like, take us through, what, so what's the hardest point? Did you raise money or did you just bootstrap it? What, what were those, some of those early pain points? So we bootstrapped them and we raised early money from the triple Fs, the family, friends, and fools. Uh, <laughs> for our, one of those triple Fs back then. <laughs> friends and family, I want to make sure you understand it includes my parents, it includes my sister, it includes Oren's best, best friend. Like really, I mean, I don't understand how we had the courage to take people from those money, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Neither do I. Anyway, and we started a model that failed miserably, which was, revolving about around the version of group therapy online with the assumption of we'll divide the cost of the session between multiple participants um, and we'll reduce the price and we will allow them to join either by video like we're doing now or by live chat or by audio so people will protect their identity because it is in the early stages of therapy the stigma is much more pronounced People do not want to reveal their face to someone they do not yet and trust yet. Uh, uh, yet. So, and and that was on our assumption. It makes perfect sense in retrospect. It just didn't work like most startups. Let's uh, add that we thought it's genius. Of course, like we, we thought that we are like the next Steve Jobs or something. When and by the way, at, at the time, Ronnie and I recruited arguably one of the most famous psychotherapists in the world, Dr. Irv Yalom, who's based out of Stanford, um, and he's like the oracle of group therapy. Um, and he's now probably 85 or 86 years old, one of the most amazing, sharp, insightful, kind people you ever met, as you can imagine. And we we got him to join with us because his theme was always, whatever helps is good. He had zero of the resistance of this industry to going online, to uh, you know, recruiting technology in order to distribute this knowledge, all the thinking that a product person will bring to the table usually is rejected very aggressively by many of the, uh, I would say, more traditional uh, players in this area. He never was like that. It's an, it was incredible. And so I want to add, um, we knew that the biggest barrier is cost. And you, we knew that we have to disrupt the cost. And we were like, what could be more genius than having five people in a room with a therapist splitting the cost so each paying twenty dollar instead of hundred and we were having a percent sure we have a winning model um of course we don't have to test to test it too much you know yeah. our intuition is good enough data not very important we're very young and naive Listen, what, what, what you learn in startups is a lot of humility yeah but what, you, but the, what we're talking about right now actually is the most pivotal point i always say you can determine the success or likelihood failure of a business by the amount of time it takes a founder to implement an inevitable decision and make the pivot or deny the reality. Like you could have just went right over the waterfall, oh, group therapy, it'll catch on. And then could you're not, not, we're not sitting here talking right now. Could not right. agree more. That's, that's, <clears throat> that's the failure. And uh, you know, what I think I learned from this is, you know, you have to find this balance point between doubting yourself and your decisions while making them again and again and again because you have to make decisions as quickly as early uh, and as decisively as possible in order to regret them yeah. soon enough you know and that's uh, that was a very uh, yeah. illuminating lesson very early on and and around i think pretty early on as you said we we actually found uh, ronnie will will tell you about it, it was a very funny incident uh concerning the fact that we're 
ignorant Israelis, you know, just off the boats, as so they let, say. So let me tell him. Hi, <laughs> Ronnie. <laughs> okay, so I remember these days so well. Like, first, we were so excited that we had 400 people who subscribed. We thought it's a lot for some reason. So we're launching like the 400 that kind of just sign up before we even launch. So we're launching this new product, basically group therapy, where you see on the web photos of therapies. And you need to click on a therapist and to join a group session. And it, it's pretty straightforward and easy. You can read their intro bio, see their intro bio, etc. And then people start to sign up and nobody, nobody is purchasing a video session with the group, with the therapist. And okay, we're saying, okay, we need to give it some month, uh, some time. So let's wait a month and then two months. And then let's improve the design. Let's improve the user experience. Let's improve the photo of the therapies. Let's make it more affordable. Like so many ideas how to improve the, the product and nothing is helping. And then at some point we're saying, okay, let's do one-on-one -on -one therapy on video. And... Again, we're launching it. We don't succeed to get uh, people who uh, purchase sessions. And then we're saying, let's do it like really, really affordable. Just to make sure that there is no problem with, with the price, we are really reducing the cost. Nothing is happening. We're already like six months into it. We're desperate, maybe even eight months at this point. We don't know what to do. We don't want to give up. Like we don't want to give up the mission, but we understand there is a problem with the execution. And then something really interesting happened. I always say this is our aha moment and this is how we pivoted, etc. cetera. Um, you know how in the beginning founders are doing everything. So I was also the person behind customer support. And all of a sudden I started getting emails from people who signed up the, the website, sharing with customer support about their clinical emotional problems. Like, you know, I, I, had a fight, I, I had a fight with my boyfriend and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, and I'm writing like, why this is like technical support, customer support. You should talk about it with your therapist. You understand the problem should be customer service, not support. <laughs> right, no, I got it. No, no that's fascinating. Support, you know? I'm right. Not, I'm not done. <laughs> so I'm getting okay. The first emails you're and and I'm starting like asking them why you are sending it to this uh, to customer support. Why you're not scheduling video session? And then I'm getting more and more. At some point, I started getting hundreds, and I'm like, Oren and I, okay, let's look at it because something is going on. So we realized very quickly by asking question, and this is where I learned how important it is to communicate with your consumers and ask them a lot of questions early on. But I learned from them that first they think that customer support mean clinical, like we're supporting you clinically. And second, I learned that they want to text with the therapist. I learned that they don't want to schedule a video session. They want to come to the site and they want to be engaged immediately. And they're, they're okay um, to get a response later, meaning asynchronous communication. This is something that we never thought about. We never thought about the therapy it could be like, you know, a, asynchronous in an asynchronous way. And then we're like, oh my God, clients want to communicate with therapies the same way they're communicating with other people in their life, whether it's friends, family, colleagues, social media, email, WhatsApp, iMessage. They just want to text, communicate, you know, with a therapist in the most convenient way. And that inspired us to revamp the whole modality and we moved to unlimited messaging therapy and we launched a new product in 2014. And very quickly, we started realizing we are in the right direction. By the way, it worked from almost day one. We, we, we had a lot of adjustments and optimizations, of course, but it was a decent product market fit almost from day one. And that insight about the video still holds. It's only changing nowadays, so eight years late after we started the companies. Because I think because of COVID-19, because so many of us all of a sudden were forced to do live video conversations that we have not done before. But up until then, people would dramatically prefer 
yeah. asynchronous communications with an emphasis on text. I would and say, only, you know, 90, over 90 percent of the communication. So that's kind of fascinating because if you think about a traditional therapy model, right, where you're paying for the session, there's always a little bit of heartbreak when the session ends and like that's sorry, we're out of time. It's like, wait, but I thought you were like mom. Like, what do you, what do you mean? This, this unconditional love, the umbilical cord is suffered so violent, suffered so violently. And they don't want to communicate for digitally, right? Because they need to draw boundaries, I assume, in any relay. And you guys, you broke the boundaries open, which is fascinating. I didn't even know that part of the model. That was the aha moment. That was the aha moment that changed everything for us and that opened the market because what asynchronicity does, it generates far better utilization or efficiency of the use of the time of both provider and patient. That is the mechanism that allows us to reduce the price. Secondly, and I think maybe the most importantly, it generates incredible levels of engagement. The frequency, just like you mentioned now, when you do customer surveys and interviews, they tell you, well, I'm just done with the, with the session, but I forget something. Why can't I text my therapist? And, and at least, therefore, they will remember it for next week, and the therapist will never do that. It's part of the boundary setting. So all of that was so this level of engagement, the frequency is a couple of times a day, five days a week, actually creates a very strong relationship very quickly between the provider and, and their patient, the, our user. So that was really the aha moment. Yeah, the therapist is really part of your life. The therapist is communicate, communicating with you five days a week and up to a few times a day based on your needs, based on your engagement level. And... And as Oren said, this flexibility and convenience really works very well for the providers as well because they can do it on top of their other commitments. They can do it late night and early morning and over the weekend. So that allowed us to drop the cost dramatically. That's fascinating because what it, what it, it converts a therapist role into more of a, a career life coach too, right? I mean, what is a therapist, right? It's somebody who can look upon your life objectively that can bring a non-biased perspective to you, a degree of kind of unconditional support, if not love, right? That that and that you sort of trust and are willing to defer some or outsource some of your judgment to, right? Who can give you that fresh perspective that almost like wakes you up. But you're right by by putting those boundaries, it makes it harder. How do the how did you, the therapist manage to have a little bit of mental space too, right? Because these problems are weighty and heavy. What is the expectation on the customer side about how long they'll get back to you and so that they can live a life? So that, that is actually a great question, and it's a major part of our back end and the way we design our product, because essentially the level of engagement is a moving target. Once you come in with a pain point and you need help now, you require a very high level of engagement. Um, and over time, as your relationship with the provider, with the therapist, you know, stabilizes and, and becomes more routine, that actually, I would say, is reduced over time. So because we are a fully digital platform and we can track how very successful treatment courses look like over time, we have a huge repository of those, I would say, journeys. So mm. someone that comes in with a certain acuity of depression or anxiety, uh, what kind of le uh, level of engagement is going to provide the best potential clinical outcome for them? And how should we spread it over time? That is built into the... Uh, engagement model for the therapists. So okay. they are being advised on when to answer, um, at what, what modality, because again, going back to the video point, as we go into treatment, if a therapist actually provides video messages, not even a, a live video, it's very, very valuable for the patient because there is a human element. And I, don't want, I do want to see that you as my therapist are human, you have a face and you have expression. So we want to augment even the people that are very adamant on using text. We want to augment it with video and audio messages and so on and so forth. So we have a whole, I would say, back end, um, very developed at this point in time to predict what level of engagement is needed in order to drive to the one thing that's important for us which is positive clinical outcomes or remissions. But it's also important to mention that in order to set the expectation for the consumers, we built a feature called Reply By, where basically every time you post, the system shows you until what time the therapist is going to respond to you. So for example, let's say I, was, I message you at 3 a.m. at night, and I'll get a message, your therapist respond to you by tomorrow, uh, tomorrow by 10 a.m., so I'm getting, I know 
you know, where I should check the platform. And this uh, setting expectation is really important for consumers. So let's catch people up. So that we make sure. So let's take them present day. What are the different models in a way that both a person or a corporation can en engage with uh, Talkspace? So we have two go to markets. One is people that prefer prefer to do therapy privately out of pocket, um, which is still I would say the the majority for our business. This is how we began. We began <clears throat> in this go to market uh, consciously because we did not think that. The United States uh, healthcare system is, is looking for any different modalities that are more efficient. It doesn't have the incentive to do that, and 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 it's doing very well financially. Um, you know, I grew up in a welfare state, in a social democracy. I believe that healthcare is a public good. I hope the United States will someday reach the same uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, and it doesn't matter which side of the corridor in the house you're at. Um, so I, I, I think none of us had high hopes about um, B2B or enterprise early adoption of very different modalities and models, so we went direct to consumer. And also it generates a very strong, I would say, uh, uh, corpus of data and clinical outcomes that allows you to do that. So most people still will use that. And then in the last two to three years, we've started doing two things. One is working directly with large employers, and we're working with some of the biggest brands in the world nowadays that are providing tox-based therapy to their employees. And I see a direct correlation between, I would say, the level of understanding of those employers, how important behavioral health is for their cultures, for the well-being of their employees, actually for the productivity and the morale within their organizations and their, I would say, uh, readiness to adopt new models. I want to pause and give you, a, give you a little quiz. So I can tell you that around 10 million people every year go and see a therapist in the United States. So that's common knowledge. Would you care to guess how many sessions they do in face-to-face -face therapy on average? So 10 million go to the United over the, in any given year? Yes. But the question is, do they come in for one session or for, I don't know, uh, six weeks, which is 24 sessions? You know, how long are they remaining? I, I'm going to guess uh, 10 sessions. Yeah. So you're pretty close. It's 1.5. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What that means is that about a third of the people that go to face-to-face -to -face therapy are missing their first appointment. It says... I will go away. I'll just get goes to therapist or cancel. Most people are doing the mode number. The most common number is one. This is they go for one uh, session, then goes to therapist, and then there's a long tail of people like me that do it for years, or maybe you. But that is, and now that is really self-destructive because those people are not only not benefiting from therapy because you cannot from one or two sessions. They're actually living with the notion of this is an unhealthy profession, which is really the damage and the pain point for us. So the reason for this entire you know, uh, detour is to tell you that when we work with those organizations, we get over 10% of their employees using uh, um, those services every year, and we get three to five months of utilization, so remaining in treatment. So, because of opening the access and what Ronnie mentioned before, removing the cost and the convenience and the stigma barriers, people will use it much more often and for much longer, therefore get better value. So right. this is why employers would work with us. We also now work with large payers. Um, I would say the large ones are including Talkspace as a network provider. So you can get coverage according to your plan. So you may have a copay or a deductible, just like they do with everything else. But Talkspace is included under that. And we are now looking at almost between 30 to 40 million covered lives. So people that have access to Talkspace services, either through their payers, their medical providers, or directly through their employers, which we think is really wonderful for our mission of opening up access, because I'm going back to my own personal belief, I think you should be covered for such services and not have to pay for it out of pocket in the long run. 
So we provide uh, both uh, both options. Well, I was going to go back to something I'll propose it to both of you, but you had said it earlier. If you look at the continuum of your journey, 2012, you know, large, much more of a stigma around it, um, but but obviously decreasing. And now mental health is an acute problem that you should be okay with receiving treatment for. I think the next sort of breakthrough would be uh, it's basic hygiene, like getting your teeth cleaned, and that there that maintaining your sense of peace and balance is going to lead to a happier, more productive life. That it's not about treating an illness; it's about you know optimizing your life. How do we kind of get to that phase and, and get that out? Because sometimes I think the word mental health also has its own stigma built into it. Wait, I am healthy. I didn't want to acknowledge that I'm, and sometimes it's actually kind of true. I don't know what the continuum of one's own self-definition of health, but you shouldn't have to engage a therapist to have diagnosed yourself with a problem, right? It should be aspirational to live a great life, you know, kind of like meditation, right? I don't need to have a problem to meditate. How do you break through that next, you know, chapter? So you're perfectly right. I mean, Therapy is all about improving quality of life, right? And allow you to lead just better, more satisfying life. And it's not really always about a mental health issue, which sounds very um, stigmatized. And so in order to do that, what we're doing, we're launching like spe special programs. So for example, we launched Insomnia program that it's very limited, eight weeks, and it's focused only... I have that problem. <laughs> I'll give you a coupon. <laughs> Every day. I'm here. Sorry. So we're, we want to look at specific conditions, specific topics that people are dealing with, with that are more kind of like general life issues and to build a program around this topic. And that would basically remove the stigma completely. And also some people really looking, they don't look to talk for therapy and they don't want to talk about your, your mom and dad and the relationship they really want to focus like something that is more a little bit like more coaching more have, actual, right something i can go ahead and implement a, a higher yield on, it, on me more right? CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy it's more solution focus it's more shorter intervention and um, and so we have like insomnia program we're built we want to build it uh, we built a coronavirus anxiety program uh, it's 16 weeks and it's all about how to manage anxiety and reduce stress that is related to COVID-19. Um, we're going to build a program for postpartum depression. So this is how we want to continue. Want to I, I think in you know in the bigger picture, if if you happen to see our campaign with the, with our partner Michael Phelps, what we look at as the mission of the company and and as the brand is actually exactly what you said, which is to put this entire notion culturally or in, uh, on a societal level in different place. And our aim is to position psychotherapy or behavioral health help, and I'll get to how different it is for different people as something which is, I would say, the favorite and the, and the frontline coping mechanism for when you have difficulties. Uh, and and I don't think it exists in the mind of mon most people in which I had a I had a fight with my wife or I lost my job or God forbid I lost a family member. It does not exist in their mind that therapy is actually a first line option to deal with that. Uh, we all know how to drink. We all know how to smoke. We all know all the uh, I would say the less constructive coping mechanisms thoroughly well, well practiced, but not that muscle that is talking about with, with the professional. Right. So, and, and our assumption in our partnership with, with Michael was that if someone who is as successful as he is actually admits to having difficulties and his need of therapy, that will apply to everyone. So that's that's exactly what we're trying to do. I, I, I love that point. And also the idea that that uh, that therapy or just working on on your sense of well-being, right, is the key to unlocking your potential that you feel is being blocked by some issues, right? It just how to create structural integrity starting at the starting at the top. You know, yes and no, because it, it's it's a great point for people that we call are the worried well, and mm -hmm. in in that respect, therapy can really help you live a better life and be more resilient and more ready for the troubles that are going to come. You know, it's unavoidable, unfortunately. But there's another segment of people who are mentally ill, mm -hmm. who are 
who are not subclinical, but they are definitely clinical. And as Ronnie said before, that is around 20 to 25 percent of the population in the United States and elsewhere. And that is actually a segment that is growing, unfortunately. We can spend a couple of years discussing why and why now and what are, what are the drivers for so many people to, to be really above the clinical threshold and really suffer, but they are there in the quantities and those people must have it. They must be feeling that it's legit to have it and must be uh, acknowledging that they have access to it because in their case, it's not just you know, I have a decent life, but I want to maximize my potential. It's almost about survival, and that audience actually, unfortunately, is growing very dramatic. And I'd like to add to it. Having said that, you know, life comes with many challenges, and maybe you are going through a very painful divorce, or maybe you lost your job, or maybe you're dealing with a very difficult family dynamics, and maybe you have you suffer from insomnia, and those issues. Uh, may lead to depression and anxiety if they are not treated. Uh, early intervention is really critical. So yes, while some people suffer from what we call clinical depression, mental illnesses, a lot of people just like, you know, are struggling. They are not proactive about their mental health and then it's deteriorating and deteriorating until it becomes a real problem that would be hard to manage. So that's why we're trying to really uh, encourage people to reach out for help uh, early and um, before it's getting worse. Let's talk about COVID, right? So a lot of people at home right now, and, and I, I assume your business has transformed in the last, you know, three months, but wh what are you seeing, feeling, what are you seeing out there? What's your message to people who are at home, who are struggling, I'd like to bring some of those issues you know, out in the open to the fore? So let me share with you a little bit what we are uh, Hearing from our Talkspace therapist, I'm leading the supply side of the company, which is a network of 5,000 licensed credential therapists. And what Talkspace share, therapists are sharing with me, that they have never seen such level of anxiety and depression before. Even therapists with over 20 years of experience, who kind of seen everything, they say this is a new overwhelming level. And just the amount of pain that they are dealing with is very overwhelming. So I want to share with you a little bit about what the, the issues and the struggle that currently our clients are dealing with. Okay, of course, economic crisis. So many clients are so anxious about losing their job or they already lost their job. Of course, losing your income, losing your livelihood causes so much stress and anxiety. Also, losing your job means losing your identity, uh, which is really hard. There is also stigma around being unemployed. So this is a huge issue right now on the platform. Another topic that we see a lot on the platform is loneliness. 35.7 million Americans live alone. Um, this is insane. <laughs> and just imagine what it means for those people who live alone and uh, this isolation, this quarantines, um, social distancing, not only it's leading to, for them to feel completely isolated, which of course leads to depression, but they're also really worried about what happened to them if they're getting sick and like literally nobody can take care of them. And so a lot of discussion about loneliness. And um, we're getting a lot of clients from, um, that are medical workers on the front lines, doctors, nurses, social workers on the front lines dealing with all the pain in the hospital. They are so burned, they're experiencing so much burnout and they need so much support. And we're getting a lot of those time. That's why we launched this donation program that you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, we're getting, oh, relationship. You know, relationship, those couples who struggled before the pandemic, like even if they had some kind of relationship issue, now with like the lockdowns and kids at home and online school, they're really struggling and they need help. And it takes really toll on the relationship and on the family. And last but not least, so many people just like grieving the loss of joy, the loss of freedom, the loss of normalcy, the loss of, you know, dealing with all the uncertainty. It leads to so much anxiety and depression. And I can tell you that we're dealing what now with unprecedented mental health crisis in this country. Hmm. 
What's your message to anybody out there? I mean, what's the easiest way to put their toe in the water if you haven't gone through therapy? Just go to, I tried going onto your site for a bit, so easy. Started texting with somebody just a, you know, a little bit wild to see, but what's your, what's you know, your first as, step? As the leader of this space, we really wanted now to double down our mission and we wanted to offer free additional mental health services. So we did a few things. One, we launched Facebook groups led by Talkspace Therapies when you can get guidance, advice, tip, coping skills from our therapists. We have almost 20 talks with therapists in those groups, already uh, over 5,000 members. And it's amazing, not only because you have access to professional therapies for free, but because there is this amazing group support and it provides sense of community, sense of belonging. You know, it's a lot about now community and support systems. So we're back to group therapy in a sense, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's just Times like this, you know, we really need to come together and support one another. And, and that's our message right now. Let's help each other. Uh, let's do whatever we can to support each other. I, I want to use the last few minutes uh, we have. All right. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about marriage. I'm fascinating listening to you to you talk. So I want to ask a big picture question, right? I always like to say that one of the problems with marriage is like it's a it's a corporation without an org chart. No one knows who's supposed to do what, and those little resentments start to start to build up. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, back to those early days, how'd you figure out who did what in the company? And let's just take it there from there for a second. So the company, you know, interestingly enough, post our uh, post our couples therapy, which essentially, you know, taught us how to talk with each other, um, and and basic skills of communications, including listening. I don't know if you you're familiar with that part. Um, uh, it helped us tremendously once we got to that point. Um, and 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 essentially, when we started the company. We, I think we divided the roles in a very natural way while discussing it to each his own strengths. You know, I had the experience in uh, managing systems before that and, and in the financial side and in the marketing side. So those are, were the areas that we agreed that I would lead. And Ronnie was much more drawn into the clinical side. Uh, and therefore, she led that entire uh, part of the business and it actually worked, I would say, you know, you tell me what you think, but extremely well from day one. And also, I think, you know, when you divide areas of, uh, of in work, in, in marriage, we'll get to it in a second, it's very different, of course. But in work, you need to have clarity. You need to have what you mentioned, this org structure, and, and you don't want to let other people to use those triangles in order to, uh, you know, just like children, uh, um, work uh, with and against your decision. So, um, I, I to the, this, after eight years doing this, or almost nine years, it feels like you know the most natural thing in the world to me that a couple are running a business together. You know, from from your other life, you must know that there are quite a lot of VCs that don't like this notion. Um, I think they're very wrong. Because I think what you get in a, in, a, in a married couple or in a couple that are running a company or a startup together is far better collaboration, and cooperation, trust. and trust than you get with founders that, um, that you know, for them, this is a, a secondary thing. For us, Talkspace is like our third child. We will always do the best thing to help it. Unless you want to be a little cynical and you say, well, if you have, you know, founders that are really trusting each other, uh, a board cannot come between them, which is sometimes a needed tool, you know. I have the opposite view. It's funny you said that. I, I actually think that the relationship is always the hardest thing to diligence, right? A relationship in somebody's life, you know, having having gone through divorce myself and like what that does to somebody, like <laughs> when you're a, when you're a couple that's working together in the same business, it's all on the table. Everything's visible and. Uh, I have the opposite. I more marvel at it. Like, how do you guys make that work? That's fantastic. You know. Sorry. And I also want to add that I think, like, in any relationship, whether it's in the marriage or as co-founders, it actually it all boils down to communication, and you know, to empathy, to listening to each other without judging each other. Um, 
to validate each other feeling, to feel safe enough to communicate and to express your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts. And I think that couple therapy really helped us in terms of communication and how to communicate in a way that is very effective and very empathetic. And it's empowering our relationship, but also it's empowering our company and us as co-founders. And, yeah. and, and I think everything at the end of the day, it's about, you know, how you communicate. Yeah. And I think it's working for us. I always say that um, the right partner can be the greatest force multiplier in the world. And that you don't want somebody who brings you back down to earth, but kind of pushes you to places you never thought possible. I happen to marry the most competent human being on planet earth who just, uh, oh, you do? yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but isn't it amazing? Like I submit to the greatness of my spouse. I think she must be a Russian spy or something because she's so well-trained across these different areas. Uh, but I'm very happy with my inadequacy. Yeah, so I want to say that, one second. <laughs> it's really empowering our relationship because it feels more equal and also to share mission to share vision um it's very powerful you know like we're living with a shared mission and i feel we both get a lot of purpose and meaning from it and i just it i feel it makes us happier also as yeah. a couple I, th I think we're lucky, really lucky in, on, on many levels, and, and we're very grateful for that, and we don't take it for granted. As to your point about, point about submitting to your spouse, I think we should all submit to women. Mm -hmm. I think the future of mankind depends on that, you know. Um, we have <laughs> failed dramatically. And it's time to try something different. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I am sitting back and uh, I marvel at my partner, who is the most level headed, compassionate, empathetic, just definitely a superior version of myself. Oh, right now, by the way, <laughs> yeah, no, she's wonderful. But and I'm, I'm, no, I'm nauseating about it. So I'm apologizing now in advance. But but I just think it's it's fun to celebrate when it works. We spend so much energy being cynical about the institution, right? I think talking about it can help people believe that one, they deserve the same thing, and two, that it actually exists and don't settle, you should seek it yeah. out, right? And I think a lot of times people don't believe they're worthy of it or they believe it's kind of a fantasy. And so I think we don't spend enough time, I think romanticizing it. So I have, I'm gonna leave on this last question. I've been spending an hour thinking about this, okay? 2012 or when you went through the issues in your marriage, had you actually gotten divorced, had not gone to couples therapy, would Talkspace exist? My two cents is probably not. I think Talkspace is the outcome of of us getting together more than anything else. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always an open-ended question, very hard to, uh, to answer. And sometimes your answers are a little bit of wishful thinking, but I really think it's the, it's the outcome of Ronnie and me coming together towards something. And therefore, if we were to separate, it probably, probably wouldn't happen. That's the most. That's so wonderful, though. Look at the legacy. We have the beautiful children, and you have, and you two on it. Oh, this is a great hug for everybody. Like you, honestly, you've affected millions of millions of people. Like it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, you've obviously done well financially, but who cares? Putting that aside, that decision to stay together and launch this company has changed the world, right? I mean, so it's extraordinary. There's still a huge way to go. We're a tiny, tiny drop in a huge ocean of misery. Really, it's yeah. just the beginning. All right. Well, this was a great conversation. I can't get enough of you guys. So now I think I'm going to become your your uh, publicist because it's just so great, captivating. But uh, yeah. thanks. Thank you for spending a whole hour. You're the best. Everyone, give Talk Space a shot. It's an incredible platform, and you're doing great work. All right. Take care. We will. Thank you, Meg. Bye. Right, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.